You're listening to the Colts Blue Zone Podcast with Mike Chappell and Dave Griffiths. Inside the Fox 59 CBS4 Podcast Studio, welcome to the Colts Blue Zone Podcast. Alongside Mike Chappell, Joe Hopkins, I'm Dave Griffiths. Appreciate you all joining us today. The Colts are here in Indianapolis, at least most of them, because as Edger and James says, he knows what voluntary means. This is a voluntary part of, a, uh, of the offseason program, but it is the beginning of the offseason program. Phase one, the Colts are one of the first teams to get together because they have a new head coach. They're allowed to gather a week or two before most other teams in the NFL are. So here we are. The offseason program has begun. Uh, there, there's always one thing after another, chap. And, and we, we talk about this all the time, that the offseason is so, is so minimal. But um, for, for these guys, they've had, they've had three months to really digest last year and to get it out of their system uh, because now it's it's kind of about it's about moving forward. I, even talking to, to guys this week, you know, Zaire Franklin says he's watched film and like you still have to do it. You see that Minnesota tape from last year and it's like, yikes. But uh, as much as looking you, there, it's a whole lot more. What I'm trying to say is a whole lot more looking forward now than than there is looking back. And I think we finally crossed that fr- that threshold or they have inside the building that it's all, all eyes ahead. Yeah. And again, just for for the facts. They're the they were the first team to report, you know, Monday, April tenth, and you get that extra week because of the new coaching staff, and that'll manifest itself into a voluntary mini camp. I think it's the twenty fourth, the three days before the draft, mm-hmm. right around the draft time. Uh, but yeah, you, you hit the ground running, and the one thing that the NFL is incredibly adept at is always staying in the news. They, they are dark for primarily the middle of June to the middle of July. And then there's stuff going on. They, they, they're very good about that. And as far as players, they generally take maybe a month off. Maybe their body won't let them take a month off when the season's over. And then they're back training. You know, I, I can remember where training camp was really hard because players came in out of shape. You know, back in the day, they had to work in the off season. Well, now they come, you know, they, they, these guys are very, you know, Shane Steichen talks about the quarterback being obsessed with his craft. Well, the, most of these players are at their own. They come in in shape, and then starting this week, it's, what is it, it's three phases. It's conditioning and rehab and meetings, and then it's positional work, nothing defense off versus offense. And then it's the last four weeks is, is the OTAs and the mandatory camp where it's, it's, they actually play football. There's no contact, but it's offense versus defense, 7-on-7, 11-on-11. So this is when it starts. And we'll get into it maybe a little bit more. But but the biggest takeaway I I had from yesterday is Shane Steichen's not looking back. First of all, he he had nothing to do with last year, except for for the one loss when, when Philly came in here and, you know, had that big comeback. But the players are trying to look ahead as well. But they can't totally put last year behind them. Like you said, Zaire said he's put on the Minnesota tape and he's saying, what? And it, it's again, it's one of those like, we couldn't make one play. You know, we couldn't do one thing different. And Michael Pittman called it, I think, the ultimate low point of his career, football career, football life. And Buck was the same, DeForest Buckner was the same way. So th- th- they'll get past that. And, and I think – any one of us in the media looking forward and, and asking these guys now about was 2022 is it going to be motivation? I think they're really going to kind of downplay that. It's looking forward. There's no way you can do it. You just can't dwell on what you didn't get done. It's a new group as far as uh, the coaching staff and a lot of new players, and you've got to look forward. Yeah, we'll certainly get into more about what the Colts had to say uh, this first week of uh, the offseason program shortly. We are also two weeks out from the NFL draft. Today we discuss wide receivers. We've done cornerbacks already. We've done defensive ends. Wide receivers this week, quarterbacks next week. Maybe they take a quarterback? Maybe they take a Maybe quarterback? they take a quarterback. That's quite possible. It's possible. Yeah. They could. Uh-huh. Maybe they'll be like Houston, who all of a sudden, according to all the reports, is going to take Will Anderson. At yeah, that, it, it, this is draft nonsense. Don't believe anything you hear. Uh huh. Well, well, well. Here's what we have heard. We we want to start Except with for the draft nonsense. Yes, exactly. Um, the 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 scuttlebutt right now, uh, uh nationally for uh, NFL draft chat is uh, at number one. The Carolina Panthers love themselves some Bryce Young. 
And uh, uh, Adam Schefter of ESPN has gone as far as to saying Bryce Young going to anywhere else on a meeting is a waste of time. That uh, that the Panthers are are, are taking Bryce Young uh, right there at number one. He's going to be their guy. Uh, and then uh, Matt Miller of uh, I believe at NFL Draft Scout or yeah, I think it works that... for ESPN now. Okay, um, I, I just know his Twitter handle. He's, yeah. he's been he's been an NFL Draft guy for a long, long time. Uh, idol of Joe uh, Hopkins. Puts out good stuff. To, to, to be honest, like he he does like puts out a mammoth amount of stuff this time of year and has for a long time. Uh, and he says that at number two, the Houston Texans really only like Bryce Young at quarterback. He's the only one of the four that they are really that interested in. So they really love Will Anderson uh, of, uh, of Alabama defensive end fame. So if uh, Bryce Young is indeed the pick to go to uh, the uh, Panthers, number one, then the Texans could take a defensive end, number two, which would certainly be uh, a, uh, a boon for the Colts with one less team ahead of them uh, taking a quarterback. And at number three, Arizona doesn't need a quarterback if they stay put. Maybe the Colts get the second quarterback uh, off the draft boards this year. But, Chap, as you point out, don't listen to anything anybody says this time of year. Somebody, again, Schefter and all these guys, do they do their work. They do. But they also answer the phone when, when a GM or an assistant GM or an agent calls and they want stuff out there. And... I would do the same thing if someone called and said, hey, you know, just, just to let you know, though, I think the – and if you trusted the guy. But but information is out there for a reason. It's just – it's like I said, as I've said before, when somebody says, yeah, I hear, you know, my sources close to Chris Ballard say, well, stop it. Because those guys, they, they, they don't share and they shouldn't share. So it, it's really hard to tell what to believe, what not to believe. It's, it's entertaining. Can you – again – if Bryce Young, in that scenario, who knows how the rest of the, the top four or five fall. Right. And that's why people were wondering, well, why why were the Colts even messing with the workouts, uh, the, the the pro days of, of Bryce Young and, and, and C.J. Stroud? Well, because you don't know. You don't know. And, and if you're not prepared for the curveball, then, then, then you're just, you, you stand there looking at it when it comes. So I understand all that. We'll know early. Fortunately, we're going to know very early on April 27th what, what's happening uh, unless these guys trade back, which I just don't think they do. Mm. So, But I, I, it's fascinating. This is one of the more interesting drafts because there isn't the consensus that it's Peyton Manning over Ryan Leaf or Andrew Luck. I don't think there was that much debate really on the Andrew Luck RG3. It's if you poll 32 GMs, I would really like to see how they have these, I'd say, five quarterbacks ranked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's, it's certainly far from a consensus, Joe. Uh, and like you, we've seen this over the years that uh, you go back to the what was it the Mitchell Trubisky, Patrick Mahomes? Were, were those the first two quarterbacks taken in that draft? It was Trubisky, then Mahomes, and then Deshaun Watson. Yeah, so there there were three that there was there was a good amount of debate uh, for, and uh, the first guy who was taken ended up being by far the worst of the bunch, and uh, uh, jury very much still out on on Watson what he's going to be able to do, but uh, Mahomes. Has has obviously proven uh, where what what he can do in the league. You go you go to other years where there's four or five quarterbacks up there. There there's always going to be maybe one year or two years. There's some more consensus, but this year is one of them where there's there's anything but a consensus. It seems like from what teams uh, believe about these guys. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the the year with um, Josh Allen and Mayfield and Darnold, where uh, in Lamar Jackson uh, and. Unfortunately for the Cardinals, Josh, uh, Josh Rosen, Rosen yes. where there was just debate left and right about who the quarterback, the top one was. It was kind of more of a pick your flavor type thing, and that's what we're seeing. That's this kind year. of what this year is exactly. Um, so w if if there's two teams who prefer the same flavor, um, they're going to be fighting over that quarterback. And I think the Cardinals still at number three are a prime trade spot. I think it's kind of wild how just, you know, a couple of weeks ago we were all just like, yeah, it seems like CJ Stroud's going to end up a Carolina Panther. And now the reports are Bryce Young, while I've simultaneously seen some negative reports about Stroud all of a sudden questioning his coachability, um, his score on the, what is it, the S2 test? 
that these quarterbacks do while Bryce Young scored a like elite grade of 98 or something mm-hmm. like that. All three of the other ones scored in the 90s or uh, whatever it was. Yeah, they, Levis was in the 90s. Richardson was in the 90s as well. Yeah, from what and, I saw. And, and then Stroud had a lower score apparently. And so all of a sudden there's some negative stuff coming out about Stroud at the same time two weeks before the draft just kind of makes me wonder if it's manufactured, if someone's trying to get him to slip or fall a little bit. I talked to uh, Bill Polian yesterday. I'm going to write something next week on on – the quarterbacks and, and just how you, you know, and he's done this a couple times with uh, Kerry Collins with Carolina and then, of course, with Peyton. You know, what do you look at and, and how do you evaluate these guys? You know, what, what goes into it? But one thing I ask him, and cause so many times desperation drives quarterbacks up the, the, the chart. You need them, so we're going we're gonna to over-evaluate this guy. And I said – is this a case of, of teams and evaluators pushing these guys up, or all five of these guys are legit? He said they're all five legit. Now, again, like like he said, there, there's pluses and minuses, and some have more flaws than the other. And he really likes Hendon Hooker. Mm-hmm. And I said, but you can't take Hooker at four. He said, if you like your guy, you take him. You take him. It doesn't matter, you know, and, and even though if it, this year would probably be a, a red shirt year. But his whole point is that I took away is this is not a manufactured draft class. These guys are all legitimate. Now, whether they all make it or not, they won't because right. they, because they don't. Prospects don't. Like, it, it, they're it's prospects like, it's for like, a reason. It, it's sort of 50-50. And heaven help the team that takes that guy in the top four, the Jets, you know, Arizona. And, and, and he's not the guy because then you're just you're – just, chasing for the next four years it's going to take you three years to find out that this guy's not your guy Mm -hmm. so then you're wasting michael Pittman and jonathan taylor and blah 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 but if you get the guy as we said if you get the guy then you really are are pretty well set but the the thing i took away again he says these guys are all legit it just depends on like you've talked about which flavor do you like yeah and and i mean it, it, I think it's a scary situation to be in if you're Chris Ballard. He keeps talking about you, you don't want to take a guy just to take a guy. You can't force it. But unless you have the guy, you got to keep swinging, unless you're completely convinced. That, but they, but they that, haven't been – you said keep swinging. They haven't been swinging. Right. It, they have point. to swing. Right. They have to swing unless they're completely convinced that Levis or Richardson or whoever's on the board it will be a failure. They're just like, there's no way this guy is going to work out. You got to take a shot on the upside because if not, you're four, twelve, and one, or you know, losing in Clown Town or whatever the situation might be. So, so you take a defensive end or a tackle at four. You don't take a quarterback in rounds one and two, and then Chris Bowder, Jim Irsay have to explain to the fan base how we're kicking the can down the road again. Mm-hmm. It will be a hard sell. Very hard sell. You, you you can't force the pick. But you can't keep waiting for that perfect situation for Andrew Luck or Peyton Manning. Right. I mean, you can you can do what other teams have done in the past, like Baltimore did, to trade up into the end of the first round and get Lamar Jackson. You develop him well, and he turns into an MVP in year two or year three in the NFL. If you got the right coaches around him, the right scheme around him, and at that point, you you face the uh, the what would be for any Colts fan right now a welcome challenge of signing someone like that to a second contract. It's a great problem to have. Exactly. You would you would kill for that problem right now because the Colts have had every other problem in the book besides that problem for the past three or four years, uh, and Baltimore is still uh, trying to maybe. Uh, sweeten the pot for Lamar to, to stay in town or him to at least be happier in Baltimore after signing Odell Beckham Jr. to a one-year deal that could be worth up to $18 million. Um, 13 guaranteed. 13.8 guaranteed. And apparently, like what I saw, somebody post, I forget who it was, that there's like four or five void years in the contract, so it spreads out the number over four or five years in the sal- when it comes to salary cap. So it's not like... The Ravens are putting eighteen million dollars on this one year, but still, it's it's a big number for a for a receiver who uh, his best years are three or four years. Didn't play last year in the past. I don't think he did. Mm-mm. No. So two years ago, he helped uh, the Rams to uh, to a Super Bowl. Tore his ACL in the Super Bowl. Exactly. He's probably on his way to what looked like an MVP level performance. Very, he was doing great in very, the first quarter or so. Very much so. So uh, so yeah, the last uh, the last time you saw him, he was playing pretty darn well. Um, after the signing, social media posts emerged with OBJ and Lamar Jackson FaceTiming together. Let's go at the club. 
party in the club. Maybe uh, maybe uh, Odell's enough to get Lamar to, to be happy in Baltimore. It, it, it's amazing how we are in the media. It, 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 at some point, you get to be almost like fans, which is not a good thing. But you speculate. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. And what does it say when Baltimore, who has hesitated, and, and to some level, rightly so, paying the guy, Deshaun Watson, level money, contract, whatever, the guaranteed money, will go out and pay a, a, re- a receiver who didn't play last year that kind of a salary for one year. Don't you think that – I mean, the, the obvious connection is, well, they, they really think that they're going to get Jackson back. They're not, who, who's the guy now? Tyler Huntley, I believe? Yes. And, and would OBJ try to have that one great year for a contract with Huntley as his quarterback? No. Is it, you wouldn't think so. So it, it's – but it, it's a strange situation – and I could I could see where OBJ it, it, or uh, Lamar Jackson, if Baltimore doesn't really sweeten things up, his point is you're paying a receiver that kind of money who's done nothing in a year, and you won't give me. I don't want to say I can't say market value because I think they would give him. <coughs> excuse me. They would give him a market value or contract, but not the guaranteed money. Mm-hmm. It's just a fascinating situation for sure. And, and uh, there there was some. Uh, kind of mentioned a little bit of the uh, the Lamar Jackson sh- situation with uh, with Shane Steichen. Um, he wanted nothing to do with exactly. it. Exactly, <laughs> that was it. That that was the, kind of the 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 crux of the story with the Colts. He wants absolutely nothing to do with talking about that. He also said we're focusing on the draft when it comes to quarterbacks. So S- some folks right re- now total back burner. It seems w- like right. Some f- guys wrote that that he basically shut the door on Lamar right. Jackson. I don't think he did. He just said I'm not. Right. Sort of, I'm not going to talk about it. Right. We're focused on people in the building now, which is, that's what you say. But that's not to say that while he was saying that, Chris Ballard wasn't on the phone to Baltimore. You know, you, you, you have different, you know, irons in the fire. But, uh, yeah, it, I thought the, I thought Jim Irsay a couple of weeks ago in the owners' meetings pretty well. Not, didn't shut the door, but kind of gave the impression of what the Colts thought about really, really seriously p- pursuing Lamar Jackson, which – we looked into it, and it's something we're not going to do. Yeah, it's the possibility also that Lamar Jackson, if, if he doesn't get a deal anywhere, if no one signs him to a contractor, and he's still on that one-year $32 million deal with the uh, franchise, that th- this would make him more likely to play, like instead of not play, if he can throw it to, That's to Odell Beckham Jr. money you never get back. Exactly. That's the problem. It's money you never get back. And from Odell's perspective, if no one else is offering him $18 million, which I doubt anybody is, even if it's Tyler Huntley throwing you the ball, like it's eighteen million dollars for one year. That that's not too shabby. Not too shabby. So, uh, one one more bit of news before we turn our attention to the Colts. That is, the Commanders appear to be very very close to being sold. Uh, Dan Snyder uh, could be very soon no longer an NFL owner. Fail your way to the top. Yeah, indeed. Congratulations. Uh, a group led by Josh Harris, who's the owner of the New Jersey Devils and Philadelphia 76ers, appears to be the front runner. Uh, there to buy the Commanders, which will be the uh, richest sale of a franchise, at least in American sports was history. Was it seven billion? I think what? it was six or seven billion dollars. B with a B billion. He, he will, he, I saw he will, he'll realize a seven hundred percent increase on his initial investment. Yeah, Dan, wow. Dan Snyder will uh, fail his way to seven billion dollars. Maybe he'll need some of that for some of his legal fees. Legal fees. Yeah, it's quite possible. So, uh, oh well, he'll he'll have five billion left over. And we were talking before we went on the air. Does this all? All of a sudden, maybe say the commanders would be up and running for Lamar Jackson. That would be incredibly interesting because Joe, as you know, last year, I mean, the uh, we talked about this. The Broncos make the sale uh, with a new ownership. You want to make a splash? You go out and get a star. They did so in Russell Wilson. It didn't work out for them last year, mind you. But they tried. But exactly, they tried hard, and th- that could very, very well be a strategy if a new owner comes in and takes control of a franchise that could need a quarterback. Yeah, try and go get Lamar Jackson, maybe try and trade up to three and and get a new young star rookie quarterback. I know a lot of people in that building like Sam Howell, but at the end of the day, he was a fifth-round pick last year. How much do you really want to hang your hat on a fifth-round pick quarterback? So um, we've seen this before, and, you know, history has shown that when these new owners get in there, they want to make a splash and make their team relevant right away. The only question will be is how quick would would, would the transfer take place and how soon would the new ownership have the ability right. to start doing that? Right. My, my, my also, my 
other point with uh, with Josh Harris is I, I made it already, like being the owner already of the Devils and the 76ers. He has a little bit more experience than somebody coming right in and owning a first franchise. Mm-hmm. So like he, he's not going to be brash, I don't think. If he wants to make a splash, he can certainly do that, but I don't think he's itching to, like some other prospective owners might have been. What so. was Denver, Walmart? The Walmart family, right. yeah. That's different. It's different. Very much the background. so. Yes. I believe their last name is Walton, but uh, obviously the Walmart uh, fortune, and, and they, they have quite a bit of it, for sure. Need new windows? Let the hometown team help. Hometown Windows and Doors is Central Indiana's premier locally owned full service Anderson dealer with master installers. From design to installation, we handle it all, carrying nationally known brands like Anderson with more options and competitive pricing. Call us direct and get 25% off your windows if you buy within the next 60 days. Please contact your hometown team today. We are Central Indiana's premier locally owned full service Anderson dealer. National brand, hometown feel. The story of Hancock Health is all about you and everything you need to live your healthiest life. Like Hancock Regional, one of the nation's safest hospitals, and an independent health network with over 70 doctors at more than 30 locations around East Central Indiana. We're growing and evolving to help further your story. And we're just getting started. See all the ways Hancock Health and you can work together to make health possible at HancockHealth.org. Um, the Colts offseason workouts have begun. We've touched on it a bit. Shane Steichen spoke to the media. Um, DeForest Buckner spoke. Zaire Franklin spoke. Michael Pittman Jr. spoke. Uh, Mike Chappell was there. I've at least listened to uh, all, of the, uh, all, all, of the, all of the availabilities. I was not there myself. But, um, Chap, what, what was your uh, – any major takeaways from, from those players, from head coach Shane Steichen, and their first availability of the offseason? My biggest takeaway is I went there hoping – Knowing it wouldn't happen, I was hoping I'd get an update on Shaq Leonard. And again, they wanted nothing to do with it. It was, I think what Steichen said was he's progressing well. There's no timetable on it. And I don't think we're going to get much. We're not going to move the ball much down the field uh, over the next, maybe during this this OTA times. I, I don't know. Uh, Zaire Franklin he he worked out a lot with with Shaq in the off season, you know, getting up at five or five thirty, which Zaire said is a little bit sooner than I like to get up. Hmm. But and again, he 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 was sort of upbeat and positive about making progress, and he's <clears throat> and he's and he's doing his work. But until we hear from Shaq, or not not even that, until we see him on the field, yeah, doing th- you know, pl- playing football, you're not going to know. And, and one thing that I one ha- one thing that how this is different from last year is he had the surgery I believe in June, the first one, and working back, working back, and I think he got back on the field. Was it the second or third week of the season? It was the Tennessee think. game. Tennessee when he got blown up, but I got the impression after we talked to Shaq late in the year that he rushed it back. So this now they don't have to. He he's got the experience of having been through it and, and what he did right, what he did wrong. So they're not going to push it, and they don't have to push it. But I I would think that the team knows and Shaq knows deep down that the second surgery worked or didn't work. I, I, just, I just have to believe that, and, and hopefully it did. And they're simply not going to push it. But doggone – when camp starts in late July, don't you think that he needs to be not on pup, but but out there? Feel a whole lot better if he was. If, if he opens on pup, it's just going to start all that stuff. Well, you know the because I think the the first time back it was, you know, he was still having some numbness or whatever. All the strength wasn't back and and all that. I would think at this at, at this point they they should know that that's that there's a difference uh, that he's better, but. Opening up on pup, that means that something's not quite right, and and if that time of rehab hasn't worked, what's another four or five weeks going to do? So hopefully, we'll get an update. I don't think we will. I think it's going to be when camp opens. What's his status? Yeah, and and I think that some people will point to what the Colts have done at linebacker this offseason, letting Bobby O'Karake go. Like the that could be an indication that. 
that the Colts like where he is. But it's also like you have Zaire Franklin, you re-signed EJ Speed, and those are two guys that can start oh. out there too. And you're you're still paying Shaq whether he's on the field or not. Yeah. So, so you, like you pouring so much money into linebacker. So, so so that's why like it, my point was I'm kind of pouring cold water on that idea a little bit. Like just yeah. because Bobby Okereke is gone doesn't mean that they think that Shaquille Leonard is okay. I think you're you're completely. I think Chap's completely right, Joe, in the fact that it, it, until we see him on the field, it's it's going to be question mark after question mark. And this is just such a unique situation. I can't really remember too many times where it's been like a nerve thing with the player. Yeah. Uh, I think the Colts basically need to prepare, and probably the fan base, this is how I'm thinking about it, like Shaq may never play again. And he, he may be the Andrew Luck of linebackers, and I don't mean that. <laughs> I mean that in a sad way, not in a, a joke yeah. at all, because off to a great start to his career, could have, you know, first three years or whatever he had healthy well, he was off to a hall of fame start to his career and then uh, just a weird freakish nerve injury like this and all of a sudden he can't get back onto the football field you got to feel bad for him but if you're the colts you got to prepare like he's not going to be there it's pretty bad when you when, when you prefer a patella or an acl right whenever it's a nerve and it's a back and it's the second surgery i realize we're all talking the pessimistic side but until but until we see otherwise how else, you know, I, I just can't go with the way he's making progress. What's that mean? Yeah, and just the fact that Steichen or whoever speaking, whether it was last year it was Frank Reich or Ballard, they're always so short with it. Correct. So short with it. Like, they're, they're very mindful not to say anything. And that, that, that puts them in that position where you know, you can see that they are being very careful not to say anything at all. Because, well, because they, they don't have positive things to say. If the, they did, they the would problem. say them. Exactly. So there, there's, there's, very little, there's very little that we can say positive about the situation right now. I would love to see him out there when OTA starts. That'd be great. That'd be fantastic. Not, not, not 100%, but just doing some drills. Dressed and running, up, wearing a dang helmet. Dancing. It, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, and, and maybe we will. But again, they have... This again is so different from last year as far as the time frame. Last year there was an urgency to get him on the field because he's a football player and he's one. He's your best defensive player as far as making a difference, and you want him to play. So maybe there was, and and he probably was his own worst enemy and pushed it too hard and got back too quick. Well, now they don't. Again, they don't have to do that. There's no game until September. But you, you would like to see some football out of Shaq before I would before training camp. Right. Uh, let, let's just get him off the sidelines. Like get him on the field. That that'd make you feel infinitely better. Infinitely better. Instead instead of the the teams going through it, you don't see Shaq, and then halfway through he comes out because he was doing some rehab work in the training room or. Mm-hmm. Yeah, be be part of the team. Yeah, that's not, uh, and again, I don't mean to. I, I'm I'm not meaning to discredit him. It's just that he's such a vital player on this team, and you want him back to where he was. Yeah, and it, you know what? Uh, getting ahead of myself here, but what happens if he doesn't play again this year? And now he hasn't played football in two years. Like. You know, uh, a third surgery, a third surgery. Does he make the decision to retire? Does he just try and play on half a leg or uh, it it just creates such a muddy situation? Yeah. So being that it's it is a muddy situation, we cannot muck it up anymore right now. So there's nothing nothing else to really discuss there. So that we'll we'll, we'll table that for a later date. It's just April. Exactly. That is good news. DeForest Buckner uh, speaking today, uh, not today, but this week um, after having a a slightly restructured contract, uh, they converted $5 million of his salary to a signing bonus, which just proves always that you can do strange things. You can do whatever you want with the cap. Exactly. You really can. And uh, that frees up two and a half million dollars of salary cap space and chap, you tweeted this out, and the, the the reason to do something like this is if a signing is imminent and you're freeing up a little bit of space, or a new contract or restructuring someone else's contract, and and the the two people who are of course under the microscope right now would be Michael Pittman Jr. and Jonathan Taylor, both guys entering a contract year, who you figure at least one of them will get a deal done uh, this summer uh, before training camp begins, if not both of them. Yeah, and the two was it? They say they freed up two point five. Two point five, I believe. That won't be enough to get it done. Spending I mean, spree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah woo! I really, 
and there are a couple other players they can address. Shaq's one of them. Uh, Braden Smith, as far as moving. And, and again, these players aren't taking pay cuts. They, they are not losing money. Mm-mm. They're just rearranging how, how you get it, nor should they. No. So, yeah, I, and we could have a show, and maybe we will, about the, 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 the likelihood or whether they should get extensions with, with Pittman and JT. In which one do you do? Do you value more? You know, Taylor is probably the better play. Not probably. Taylor's a better player, but he's a running back. And Pittman was probably. We'll get into this later on with our receivers. I thought Pittman was the most impeded player on the team last year because of how poor the passing game was. They made him look like. Well, he was a possession receiver. Less than a guy. I mean, like, you say just a guy. He right. wasn't even that. Right. Made him look like Jack Doyle out there. Right, right. So, but it, it is, in your mind, is 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 he a $20 million a year receiver? I don't know. Uh, so, you know, Taylor's your best player, but he's a running back, and they have a shorter, shorter shelf life, and I think maybe an extension would, would reflect that. Pittman's the one that's really, really interesting because of – how they've handled receivers, and, and which which is a negative, but the receiver room, which, gosh, you need him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now it'd be one thing if maybe Pittman was your number two receiver, and, and then he becomes expendable. Him at number one and being really the only consistently good wide receiver you've had since T. Y. Hilton's heyday. Uh, you you got to keep him while you got him. I say go ahead and give him a three year, twenty mil a year. Give Taylor three years. 15 mil a year, something like that. Go draft a rookie quarterback. And you don't look back. You just do it. You just do it. And then in three years, you reevaluate. Um, that would get Taylor through the last year of that contract on a three year extension, age 26. So still not, not ancient for a running back. Um, and then I think Pittman would be a little older than that. Obviously, receivers can last longer. but And, and it helps them too, because especially with Pittman, he might be able to hit the market again a second time. Uh, well, he will. It, mm-hmm. it, exactly. Uh, well, both the players will as long as they're still healthy and playing, but Pittman might be able to still get a big deal. Um, who knows how ta- if Taylor looks at age 26, running backs can just really hit a cliff, but he's still an elite player when healthy right now. Well, we'll dive into wide receivers in a minute, but first, what does Hancock Health's membership in the Mayo Clinic Care Network mean for you? It means our independent health network now has access to the knowledge and resources of the world leader in medicine. It means your Hancock Health doctor can now consult with Mayo Clinic specialists to confirm a diagnosis or treatment plan. And it means that together we're making health possible for you. Learn more about our new clinical collaboration at HancockRegional.org front slash Mayo Clinic. Need new windows? Contact your hometown team today. Hometown Window and Doors are Central Indiana's premier, locally owned, full-service Anderson window dealer with master installers. From design to installation, the hometown team handles it all. They carry unlimited options with competitive pricing. Call them direct to get 25% off your windows if you call within the next 60 days. Hometown Window and Doors gives you all the perks of a national brand with a hometown feel. Visit them at hometownwindowteam.com today. The Colts wide receiver room right now is not the most impressive in the NFL. We've heard that before several years in the past. Several years in a row, in fact, we've heard this. I do feel a little better this year than I did at this time last year. I'll say that. <coughs> you think so? Yeah, because uh, Alec Pierce was promising going into year two now. Um, what were we saying at this time last year? Well, he didn't even have Alec Pierce at this time last year. It, it was Michael Pittman Jr. It was an injured Paris, Paris Campbell. Paris Campbell, who'd never played more than four or five games in the season. Yeah. yeah. Patman, Strawn. Patman, Strawn, Doolin. Doolin. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, okay. Yeah. It's it's a it's a step better than last year. At this this time. time last year, we were like, are they going to re-sign T. Y. Hilton again? Right. Right. Yeah, good point. So right now, it's Michael Pittman Jr., Alec Pierce, Isaiah McKenzie. Uh, over from Buffalo. I like him. Then uh, Dave's pick for Colts breakout player of 2022, Ashton Doolin. <laughs> How'd that work out for uh, you? Not, not well. And, and Mike Straw. Not because I don't think of anything wrong with Ashton Doolin yet. You get, <laughs> I'll just say that again. <laughs> but once again, uh, players who are hampered by the complete lack of a passing game last did year. You have, did you have Blankenship as your breakout player one year? I think he was on the list. I think my breakout player was Quiddy Pay. Yeah, okay. I think you are right. I th- uh, but he was on your fair. list. Yes, 
He was on my list because he needed to be, and then yeah. he he ju- he didn't break out. He just broke. <laughs> <laughs> he broke out of the out of the roster, out of the, the league. Lineup. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, so so you look at those five guys, like even like I, I think Colts fans can look at this and and get lost in the potential of the first two. Like I I think Pittman Jr. has has a decent amount of potential in this. So league. do I. I I think Alec Pierce could really turn himself into a very good player in this league. But right now, they're not there, and you don't know it for sure. You look at this group, and, and, and you, cannot, you cannot look at it and say, no, oh, they're good at wide receiver. You just can't do it. And I, I think there are worse positions, like we've already talked about. We talked about cornerback being far worse right now for the Colts. The fact that they have, as Chap pointed out uh, before our show, they have one player at cornerback who was drafted. That's it. Everyone else... And he was a six-round pick. Exactly. Isaiah Rodgers was a six-round pick, and everyone else at corner has been undrafted. But that that I, it, it, the, 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 um, the just how bad corner is uh, does, does not take away from your need to improve at other how areas. How inadequate and, receivers yeah, exactly, are. Exactly. That's, that's a good way to if put it. You look it. at it like this, Colts probably have the second-best wide receiver group in the AFC South. Yeah, that's, that's a positive spin on it. <laughs> There's always a positive spin. Sometimes it's tougher to find <laughs> being in the AFC South helps sometimes with uh, with that but uh, but anyway the Colts have drafted a wide receiver in the second round in three of the last four drafts in fact as Joe points out here on our rundown with Paris Campbell Michael Pittman Jr. and Alec Pierce so it's an area that they have devoted some significant draft capital toward um, trying to hit on one of those guys it's very unlikely that they will use a first round pick on a wide receiver this year, unless they trade back, which uh, would, again, set the uh, Colts' internet ablaze if that was to be their decision. Uh, this year, the wide receivers are not as good as, I think, last year's crop or maybe two years ago. But, Joe, there, there are a couple guys in the, um, in, in the draft, and we'll get into them in, in a minute or two after we finish uh, kind of going through uh, the, the Colts' draft picks. But they're there are some there are some picks to be had. You think this year, even though it's not the the depth is maybe not there that there we've seen in recent years in the draft. Yeah, there's. I, I think you know typically you see what an average of about five wide receivers go in the first round. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to see that this year. I think maybe about three or four go, um, and, and maybe most of them in the twenties. I think the first guy is Jackson Smith and Jigma from Ohio State. Uh, he was had a hamstring this year, so. Um, he, he didn't put up the high-level production this year as he did the year before, but terrific route runner, uh, really good hands. He lacks elite athleticism, so that's why he's not regarded as like a high-end, you know, top five, top ten uh, draft pick. But uh, I think he'll probably be the first one off the board. And then the rest of the guys are just kind of like uh, similar to the quarterbacks, what's your flavor type guys, and – you know, uh, going through the, the the process here, the wide receivers, a lot of small wide receivers in this year's group, a lot of guys under six foot, which, you know, uh, just goes to speak to that flavor. And luckily for the Colts, they have a couple giants on the outside already. What they need is a slot guy, a guy with great short area quickness who can create separation and give them some run after the catch ability. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing for the Colts this year, looking at the other guys who could go in the first round, I think Zay Flowers out of Boston College is one of them, only 5'9", but he's 182, ran a 4'4", 240, um, great after the catch, uh, explosive player, just doesn't have that size that some teams are looking for. And then Jordan Addison out of USC, probably going to go in the first round as well. He can play inside or outside for you, works all three levels, another very good route runner. He's only 5'11", 173, so not quite as thick as a Zay Flowers, um, but he's one of those guys who can kind of get over the top for you. Uh, so, I, I mean, if I was going to pick one wide receiver other than Smith and Jigma to put on the Colts this year, it would be Zay Flowers just because I think uh, he just fits so well with what they don't have. you got two tall guys with 
six four Pittman, six three Pierce on the outside, and then having a guy like Zay Flowers work the slot, really create separation with his start stop ability and quickness, and then be able to catch the ball on a five yard route and break a couple tackles, pick up fifteen to twenty yards. That's what they don't have right now. McKenzie, Isaiah McKenzie can maybe give them a little bit of that, but there's a reason Buffalo cut him, and then that's because he he's a solid role player but he's not a guy who's really going to consistently change games for you I think Zay Flowers could be and if he's there at what 35 is their pick there in the second round I think the Colts would have to consider him heavily chap when you when you look at uh, possibilities for the draft you always have to look at history you know you look at Chris Ballard's history what has he done uh, you're gonna have to look at Shane Steichen's history now, uh, being the head coach here. Like, what, what is he? Who has he used in the past? And for Chris Ballard, you see the guys he's drafted. It's been, it's been big wide receivers. I mean, with Pittman, as Joe pointed out, Alec Pierce, both very large guys who are more outside receivers. You go beyond that, he's drafted guys like Mike Strawn, Des Patman, um, even, even Paris Campbell is not a small receiver uh, when, when they took him. Uh, he was he was not like your typical slot size small guy like five ten nah, shifty he was dude solid six foot exactly so uh, so that's that's what Chris Ballard has done in the past that's the type of guy you look at who uh, Shane Steichen uh, worked with just last year in Philadelphia and obviously AJ Brown is a freak uh, <laughs> he's the uh, the guy that everyone wants on your roster except Tennessee exactly ooh <laughs> but very true. Um, he also, uh, how good A.J. Brown was, uh, I think nationally might have overshadowed how important Devontae Smith was to that team, the former Heisman Trophy winner uh, from Alabama, who was crucial in the slot, whose numbers were very close to A.J. Brown's, uh, over 1,000 yards receiving himself. So uh, Shane Steichen found a way to, to work a very important slot receiver into his offense, who was just almost just as uh, dangerous as A.J. Brown was over the course of the year. So you look at that and you think, well, Shane Steichen could use more of a, uh, a slot threat uh, in his in his offense. Maybe that is somewhere that the Colts will be eyeing in this draft to uh, to try to find a guy to fit uh, into that role. Yeah, I think what, what Joe mentioned is McKenzie's probably the fallback. If we don't get that guy in the draft, then we've got this guy. And, and one thing that, that – Chris Ballard generally does he, he, is he trusts his numbers for positions. He, mm-hmm. he just does. Uh, and, and he does it for a reason, and probably 90% of the time it bears out that's what you should do. What's going to be interesting is will they have a second-round pick? If they trade up, You know, would that involve giving mm-hmm. up your – and I think they would fight to not give up their second-round pick. I really do, even if that means giving up more – you know, a three and something strong next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you look at the if you look at the makeup of the roster, doggone, the second round pick needs to go for a cornerback or an offensive lineman. But if I'm not if with this team reloading with a young quarterback, if you're not going to give him an offensive lineman in round two, which they've not done since when. Uh, well, Braden Smith. He was round three. No, no Braden, Braden, Braden was, was a two. two. He was in two. R- oh, Ray, sorry. R- I'm R- Raymond was a three. Yeah, yeah. If you're not going to say offensive line in round two, then it needs to be receiver. It just does. Don't bring in a, a, a young quarterback and then handcuff him with either a lack of protection or a lack of options in, in the passing game. They've got the run game. So wh- while the, the roster cries out that you need at least two – high to mid-level cornerbacks unless they've got somebody in free agency that you know rock you seen i don't know mm-hmm. but i i could see i could see receiver again and this would be their highest receiver in round two Pittman was 34 okay okay um but yeah i mean and it's tough to argue for receiver when you think about how bad the offensive line was last year the idea of starting Will Fries again at right guard, um, the idea of having Dallas Flowers and Isaiah Rogers go into the season as your two outside cornerbacks. But but when you prioritize things, the most important thing is making sure you set up your young rookie quarterback for success. And Gus Bradley's defense has to suffer because of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that uh, I think that I I'm on the same page as you guys. Like, if you're going to draft a quarterback, you, you need to try to set him up for success first. 
and everything else is is on the back burner. You say, Gus, you've been in the league for a long time. Let's see what you can do with these suck, guys. Suck it up, buddy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah this right. is uh, this is the cards that 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 we are going to deal you. We know exactly which cards they are. We have We're going to stack how, the deck. We have seen how this team has uncharacteristically set up players to fail the last few years, and that's just not you, you just can't do that in this situation. So. Whether, you know, when you draft a young quarterback, whether he starts day one or whether he it's October, I don't know. But get the foundation there that you've got players around him to build with. Let, let, let me give a little bit of a, uh, a positive uh, here because we've been kind of negative about the Colts wide receivers and, and understandably so. But last year, there was just there was so little that. How do you judge them? Exactly. That the Colts receivers could be judged by last year, especially in attacking downfield. I think that that highlights mostly that there, there was no one on the roster last year that was capable of being a good slot receiver um, because those routes would have been the routes that are open, the short, quick ones right away. And no one was able to take advantage of that role at all. Uh, there was maybe both Pittman and Pierce could be more downfield threats with a capable quarterback and a capable offensive line and a run game you and trust. a run game as well. But but you could not you could not judge that. So I, I be, and I think you look two years ago at what Pittman was able to do uh, that year and be able to attack down the field more often. And the Colts as a team certainly attacked down the field more often. But last year was just uh, and and you touched on this earlier, chap was. Uh, for for Pittman being w one of the most uh, handcuffed guys or hamstrung guys because of what happened last year. You just could not see what he could do. You could not see everything Alec Pierce can do. So I think at the same time, like you should be optimistic, Joe, about the steps Alec Pierce can take if, if the Colts do enough to shore up quarterback offensive line to try to have uh, a guy who's uh, more capable to throw the ball down the field and a line that's capable of blocking long enough to allow him to do that. Yeah, I think all things considered, you got to be pretty stoked about what you saw from Alec Pierce. Nearly 600 yards for a rookie is good in just about any situation, especially a rookie who went into the 50s, you know, late second round. Um, and then when you consider all the factors he had to deal with, you got to think that's pretty good 600 yards, 41 catches, a couple touchdowns. Um, and we saw the flashes where he just made some spectacular catches out there. Um, I think Pittman could attack down the field more as well. But with Pierce, I think part of it is Pierce took that role because that's what he was good at. And he wasn't quite as good at some of the intermediate routes as Pittman was. And so they said, we're not going to ask a rookie to do things he's not good at yet. You know, you can't send everyone deep on every play. So I think that was part of the reason we didn't see Pittman get as many downfield opportunities. And, and it'll be interesting to see how roles might change when Steichen um, gets his hand on the offense. I still think that Pierce will be the primary downfield threat because that's what they brought him in here to do. He's faster than Pittman. Um, he can jump higher than Pittman. He can go down the field and make those splash plays. While Pittman, I love on the intermediate routes, maybe – 10 to 20 yards um, and catch him on a crosser. And then he breaks a tackle with that size and keeps going. There's a, a lot of uh, – at you, you mentioned the top three receivers already. There, yeah. there seems to be a, a good a good chunk that are, are day two prospects. A couple of guys that are uh, bigger, deep threat guys that well, you figure maybe the Colts have that. But at the same time, these are the guys that Chris Bowd has drafted in the past. Maybe he goes for them again. But – there are also a couple of slot receivers there that uh, that are that are pretty intriguing, even if Zay Flowers is off the board already. Sure. I mean, and, and just to kind of work our way through that and down here, uh, Quentin Johnson is the premier, like, this is what Chris Ballard usually looks for. 6'3", mm -hmm. 208, 449, 40-inch vertical. But they already have that on the team, so it seems a bit redundant. Maybe Jalen Hyatt out of Tennessee, he's really like that Will Fuller type player who can take the top off. But I'm not sure he exactly fits that slot role either. Um, looking at some of these day two players here, a guy like Josh Downs out of North Carolina. He's not very big, 5'9", 171, but he ran in the 4'4", 38.5-inch vertical, shows his explosiveness. And, and he's a route runner with good hands, good run after the catch ability. I think he would do some damage from the slot. 
Some other guys kind of in that mold, Marvin Mims out of Oklahoma. He can play a little outside if you need him to as well. 5'11", 183, a little bit bigger, but he ran in the high four threes. Uh, again, another very good nearly 40-inch vertical. Uh, Tyler Scott from Cincinnati ran a 4'4", 40. He's got that great speed. He's another guy who, who you know, 5'10", 177, but you put him in the slot and he can do some damage for you. So I think several guys like that. Um, are kind of what the Colts are missing from this group. Even a, you know, if you want to go even smaller, Tank Dell out of Houston, 5'8". 5'8", 165. Yeah, yeah, buddy. So he might he might fall. I, you know, I might be surprised if he's a second-round pick, although we saw the Giants take Wandale Robinson pretty high in the second round last year, and uh, he's not very big either. But he's really a slot, gadget-type player. Um, scored a ton of touchdowns for Houston, but he also had 21 drops over the last couple of years. So hands might not be the most reliable. He's just one of those players who get the ball in his hands. And once he's got a hold of it, he can do some damage with it. He's the first wide receiver ever at 5'8", whose name is Tank. <laughs> <laughs> it is not what you would well, expect. If it, if it was 5'8 and 2'10". Yeah, exactly. That, that he could be Tank. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, it, it's kind of like when you got a 6'5", 300-pound guy named Tiny. Exactly. You know? Uh-huh. But um, there, there are some, some really good athletes at wide receiver. There's another you haven't mentioned yet is Jonathan Mingo is more of a mid-round prospect you have there. Who uh, I, I actually did a uh, – I, I, I tweeted it out. So if you follow me on Twitter, you can see it at DaveG underscore sports. My all RAS draft, all uh, relative athletic score. Um, I took uh, all guys who are nine plus – uh, starting with Anthony Richardson at four overall, so Joe was doing backflips when uh, when he saw, I'm sure. But uh, but Mingo was on there for me. He's a 6'2", 220 pound guy, so that that's a tank right there at two twenty. That's AJ Brown size. Exactly. That that's big, and when we love AJ Brown, he runs a four four six forty as well, thirty nine and a half inch vertical. So so his athletic scores are again th- those are things that Chris Ballard salivates at, like the, the guys that can do these things. Um, w- w- what he what he has, he, he lacks, uh, as you put here, suddenness and has had average production at Ole Miss. Um, I, I, it, how you evaluate wide receivers coming out of the draft chap is always interesting to me because in, in college, obviously, there's so many offenses in college that are so limited. Offenses in the NFL, they expand. So in college, you say, oh, he has a limited route tree. He didn't run that much. Well, is, is he smart enough to make it at the next level? That, I, I'm more concerned with how smart or how uh, like how much these wide receivers understand the game and understand what they were supposed to do than I am concerned with like complete production and all route tree that they were able to do. You know, in, in college, I look all the way back to Calvin Johnson, who is uh, obviously an aberration from every wide receiver. Top five like, all time, ever. probably. Yeah, but. But he played in college at Georgia Tech when they were running the option. So you look at a, a, a limited route tree. I mean, his was incredibly limited back then. But he came to the NFL as an incredibly smart guy. He went to Georgia Tech, for crying out loud. And he developed into what he became, and which was a top five wide receiver all time. So like, I, I, I don't care so much about maybe limited route tree, limited production in college. I want to see guys who have traits, which Chris Bowden has drafted in the past, and guys who are smart enough to take their game to the next level and understand an NFL offense. And then you put them in Reggie Wayne's room. Yep. And I think, you know, for all the for all of us who wondered how Reggie would would gravitate to being a coach, how long would he do it and all this, he loves it. He came back for year two. He came back for year two and for all you people that had the under, you know, at, you know, at one, you, I had the under. You lose. I, I probably would have lost too, <laughs> because I, I, I didn't know, and I, st- I still don't think he's a lifer. I just don't. He's not going to be a. I don't think a ten or fifteen year coach. I don't think, but he loves working with his kids. He does. He calls them kids because he's, he's. They old. are to him. They are to him at forty years old. But I, I, I think he, he is still close enough to his career that they understand who he is. This isn't like the running backs with Tom Rathman. Right. Who you needed to have, you know, clips of. People know who he is. They respect him. And he relates to him. And just watch him at a watch him at training camp or watch him at the OTAs. And he's on these guys. He's talking routes. He's talking the detailed stuff, which made Reggie who he was. You know, one of the one of the top three receivers in franchise history. Mm-hmm. So I think, like you said, I think Ballard and his staff will find the right guys who have the traits, the intelligence, the versatility, 
And you let Reggie kind of get it out of him. Yeah, what I'm saying there, Joe, with like traits and traits and intelligence more so than production matter to me in, in from the college game. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. You look at who was it uh, out of Minnesota a couple years ago? I'm Bateman. Blanking. No, no, he I th- he went to the Bucks. Um, but anyway, it, there's some college guys who are just great college guys, and they don't have the traits to go to the NFL. Traits are why we're talking about Anthony Richardson uh, as a top three or four draft pick in the NFL. It's all about what you're going to do at the next level. I don't think we've ever seen a better example of that than Josh Allen. Um, So uh, the trait that I think the Colts really need is a guy who has that quickness, who can really create a lot of separation and wide open throwing lanes for this young quarterback to come in and get some easy ones. Uh, I, I think Pittman for a big guy is pretty good. At route running and doing that, I think Pierce needs some work. And so I, I want someone who you're going to be able to put in the slot, give him a simple route, and he's going to be able to use his stop-start ability to create some easy five-yard pitch and catches. Yeah, you, there, there's a difference between wide receivers who take time to, to get their route and to get to do their damage, and they, and they are very valuable. And then there's guys who do, do not take as much time. To get uh, to get separation, you look at Miami is a perfect example because you have Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle who can get get open like that, and Tyreek is another one who's special because he can he can spend a lot more time too and, and, and hit you deep as well. Like his his, his skill set is is much He's more. He's one of those freakish guys exactly, too. Exactly, well rounded like that. But I mean, um, just just think of how many times it was as a Colts fan so frustrating to watch Tom Brady in the Patriots mm-hmm. and he would just drop these little passes to Edelman or Wes Welker, and it would just be a five-yard pass, but it would turn into 12 yards because yep. he would hit him in stride and they would have room to run. And then you look up at the end of the day and he had 300 yards passing, and you're like, but they were all on five-yard passes. As long as 27 yards yeah. or whatever. The frustrating thing watching that was like uh, on a third and seven chap, you know, you, you never want like – the, the the general consensus is don't throw for four yards on third and seven, but like he would do that to Edelman. He would do that before that to Wes Welker or Gronkowski, whoever it is, but he'd hit them like as they're coming out of a break, and so you'd catch it short of the sticks, but then you're your momentum takes to go and you go straight right over the sticks and it's a first down. So like that like th- those receivers they're they're hard to find or, or else everyone would have them and everyone would uh, be closer to Tom Brady than they were. So like to be able to find a guy with that kind of that kind of talent who who is who is a quick receiver like you said Joe who can uh, who can work the middle of the field, who is fearless in that aspect, who can come out of a break and catch the ball right away and turn up field immediately. And like and I don't expect this rookie quarterback and whatever slot receiver they have to develop that kind of chemistry. I mean, Tom Brady's obviously an all-timer. Right. But I'm just trying to illustrate, like, some of the easy ones out there. We don't have to work hard for every single yard all the time. You can drop some easier plays that just appear so simple. But it's, at the end of the day, smart football because you're working smarter, not harder. And, and, and everything comes down to, as we've said, just developing the quarterback and, and giving him options. I think if you have options to go deep, awesome. You got that. You got Pittman. You got Pierce. Uh, you got some tight ends who are look yeah. like freak athletes. If you can get some wide receivers that can attack short and, and give you uh, uh, some easy yards and – uh, keep you in third and manageable just helps immensely. Helps immensely. There's going to be times in a game you need to make the hard throw mm-hmm. and and and, make, and 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 take the risk. But there are so many times that, that you can take the easy the easy play, and that's what the Colts have, have not done recently is take that easy play and get seven yards where it's second and three. You got to make the hard throws to win the game at times, right. mm-hmm. but you lose the game by missing the easy throw. Layups. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. Who was that about? Uh, I, I, I don't remember. Uh, it, 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 it's past me. We, we do appreciate you listening to the Colts Blue Zone podcast. That has been our discussion on wide receivers. We're going to get into quarterbacks next week. And the draft is just around the corner, two weeks away. Uh, really looking forward to seeing what the Colts can do and, and, and how much more draft nonsense we have to discuss uh, between now and then. What comes out, what is, a, what is real, what is not real. Uh, it'll certainly be exciting. You can follow us all online at Colts Blue Zone on Twitter. Uh, follow up with Colts news and notes throughout the week. I am Dave Griffiths at Dave G underscore sports. Uh, Mike Chappell's at M Chappell 51. You can also follow his work online. Fox 59.com CBS 4 Indy.com. We'll see you next week on the Colts Blue Zone podcast.